Hallmark Beach for the great outdoors. See your Chevy dealer, where you'll find over 90 different ways to enjoy it all. On the heartbeat of America, Chevrolet, that's today's Chevy truck. Welcome to the Sportsman's Workshop, brought to you by the heartbeat of America, today's Chevy truck. Obviously, we're just about ready for today's goose hunt in the cornfield, and as you can see, we have most of our decoys set, but a prime consideration, very prime, is wind direction. Now, once we have our wind direction determined, point the decoys into it. You know, not all geese are into the wind all the time, and they don't feed into the wind all the time, so mix them up just a little bit. If you'll notice, Terry's behind us placing the last of the decoys, but on behind Terry, you'll see a space. That is a landing zone where we want the geese to land in too. Off to the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see another open space between decoys, another landing zone. We want the geese to land in our killing zone. Now, our killing zone is roughly 20 to 35 yards distant from the pit or blind that we're going to be shooting in today. We know that within that distance, if we hit the geese a good shot, we're not going to have any cripples get away from us, and that's prime consideration. Next thing you have to consider is family groups. Now, if you'll kind of scan the decoy field, what you'll notice is a group of geese here, a group of geese there, a group of geese here, all little different families into one feeding area of geese. Set your decoys the same way, remembering decoy patterns, which could be a J pattern, a hook pattern, in other words, a V pattern, or an I pattern. But whatever pattern you use, turn it into the wind, but at the same time, set family groups. You'll get more geese down to investigate your decoys, and that's what it's all about, getting the geese down to within a good killing zone to where we know we're not going to miss or we're not going to have any cripples. You know, an important factor that a lot of people don't realize is when geese are alarmed, they have their heads up. So we have sentries, which is the long neck, stand-up type neck by you see behind me. We also have the feeder type decoys, as you see with the head down on the ground. Normally they come two feeders for every sentry. Well, I think that's a little bit too much. I think basically what you should have is a probably one sentry for every eight to ten feeders. As you can see in the background, and you check your decoy spread, let's make sure that our sentries are on the outside edges of the decoys. And as you scan out towards the outside edge of this decoy field, you'll notice three walkers. I call them walkers because they're sentries I have on the outside edge there, walking in to the area where the geese are feeding. Everything looks natural this way with very little alarm. As you can see, we're using super magnum decoys out here for our basic set. I firmly believe that we have to have full body. But if you'll notice off to the right-hand side of your screen, you will see silhouettes, real large silhouettes off to the right-hand side. Those are our basic attractors, and I think every good set should have large silhouettes. Try that, and I'm sure you'll get more geese in your decoy field. Now, a little more on numbers of decoys. As we begin our goose season, which is early, most of the geese have not seen a decoy set in a number of months. So you can start out with a few decoys, maybe four, five, or six dozen. But as the season progresses, what transpires is many hunters are in the field, and they become very wary of a few decoys, so increase the amount of decoys you have as the season goes along. Out here today, we have roughly eight dozen in our field. Now, this is mid-season, but in another month, I will have probably 10 to 12 dozen on the ground just to help fool the geese into coming down for that one shot that we're always looking for. You know, remembering the basic points now, wind direction, number one. 
type of pattern you're going to set and don't forget the family groups and always increase the number of decoys you're using as the season goes on. Those will be points that will put more geese in your decoy spread. Tell you what, let's do. Let's get back in now and let's do some goose hunting. I got my trusty hunting partner with me today, Terry Nicholson from Anglers All, and we've done a lot of goose hunting together and been rather successful. And between the two of us, we know that the most critical thing after learning how to set decoys is using the goose call itself. There's three basic calls, and I think you'd agree, Terry, that uh, number one would be the hailing call. When you see geese a long way off, use the hailing call to call them to you. Number two is after you get them to you, you got to coax them to come down and take a close look at your decoy field. That's the coaxing call. And number three, really critical, if they leave your decoy field, call them back to you. That's the hailing, or the, excuse me, the comeback call, okay? The comeback call. Now what I'd like to try to do is give you one of each so you can understand and practice this on your own. First, the hailing call. The short karunk, karunk, karunk. <laughs> That's the hail the geese into you. Now, the coaxing call is kind of a little short start with a gradual taper off. Now, if they leave your decoy field, we obviously want them to come back. The comeback call is very similar to the hailing call. Get them to come on back to you. Now, if you're hunting with a partner, such as I do with Terry all the time, we try to call simultaneously, not exactly together. So I'll ask Terry to get started with his goose call, and I'll mix in my sound with his to sound like a flock of geese are around. <laughs> an idea of what you and a partner can do to really bring the geese down on the ground. So remember, hailing calls, coaxing calls, comeback calls, and then the whole flock right in on you. Remember that, and you'll be more successful. Now that we've got the geese in the decoy field, the next most important thing, obviously, is the shotgun you're using. You know, talking about shotguns, there's basically three types. There's a breakover, a pump and an automatic. It depends on your personal preference. I know I have mine. Uh, this happens to be an over and under. And it's simply an over and under because one shot's above and one shot's below. You simply load it up and close the action and you're ready to shoot. However, you have to remember when that action closed, she's ready. The safe must go on immediately when the action is closed. The next type of shotgun that you can use happens to be a pump. And the pump shotgun is just simply what it says. It pumps to close. Now, as with pumps and automatics, hunting migratory birds, you're only allowed three shells. Your cylinder up here on the pump and a cylinder in the automatic must be plugged so it'll only hold two. One in the chamber, two outside in the cylinder. That's a pump. Simple fact, you drive the pump home, but make sure when the pump is home, that it's on safe. The third type that's very popular around the country is an automatic. Again, three shells, and it's spring operated, and bang, 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 and you're home free. But one thing about automatics, when you clean them at home, and you intend on using them in a goose blind or a goose pit, make sure you put very, very few drops of oil on there and dry it out after you got oil on the gun because the action on an automatic will collect dirt and dust and it will actually foul on you in the field. And that's not the time for it to foul on you in the field. Not the time. Now, you look at gauges. My goodness, there's eight gauges, 10 gauges, 20s, 12s, 410s. It really doesn't matter what you want to shoot, but there's what you have to think about is where you're going to shoot. We're hunting over decoys, and I've shot them with 410s out there, I've shot it with 20 gauge, but I always like to use a 12 gauge because to me it's very forgiving, a 12 gauge. I like to use a 3 inch 12 gauge. A lot of, now 3 inch means the length of the chamber that the shot shell itself will fit into, okay? 
12 gauge, three inch is what I use. A lot of people use 12 gauges chambered to two and three quarter inch. But 12 gauge is excellent. Now, a sporting chance would be a 410, which is exciting and you have to be a good shot. You have to make sure over decoys that the birds are well within range and 20 yards out maximum is what I like to think. And a 20 gauge now is a little bit better. You got a little greater distance with it, but it's still deadly over decoys and hey, you don't have all of that recoil that you have with a 12 gauge if recoil bothers you. Let's talk just a little bit about the sizes of the shot shell we're going to use. You know, you've got eights and sevens and sixes and fours and twos and BBs and God knows what all. We've got a tremendous amount of shot, but Terry, what size shot do you prefer now over decoys in a 12 gauge, three inch Magnum? Over decoys, I would most often shoot either fours or twos. Uh, fours are, uh, you can get a few more in a shell when you're shooting fours and you'll get a denser pattern and over properly decoyed birds, those birds that are inside 40 yards, it is, uh, it is, it is a sufficient shot. Uh, what I ideally like to do is shoot a four on that first shot and follow it up with a two in my over and under. Um, now, I, why, why are you going to shoot fours first and two second? Well, theoretically at least, the first shot's going to be closer. And if the first shot uh, is closer, then I would prefer to have more pellets in the pattern, shoot a little bit denser pattern, and uh, um, then follow it up with that uh, little bit heavier shot to uh, either take a second bird or to finish off a first bird with. Um, it is my own personal preference to shoot uh, 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 geese over decoys with, with a two-barreled gun, either an over and under or a si side by side. Make the first shot with a little more open choke, like an improved cylinder, with fours, and the second shot a little bit tighter choke uh, with size two shot. You know, when you're talking about the various types of chokes in a shotgun, you have improved, modified, and full. Now, one way for you to tell uh, the different choke in your shotgun is by the use of a dime. In an improved cylinder, a dime will go all the way in and rattle around. The modified cylinder, the dime will fit snugly in the end of the barrel, and in a full choke, it will not go in at all. Improved cylinder throws a wider pattern. A wider pattern at, let's say, 40 yards, maximum decoy range, and then a full choke would be a closer pattern. It shoots a tighter pattern. That's exactly so right. So if I'm shooting an over and under, what two chokes should I have in my over and under or side by side? Well, you, you could go a couple of ways. You could shoot either improved cylinder and modified. Um, uh, improved cylinder for the first shot, modified for the second shot. Uh, the um, other way to go is with modified for that first shot and full choke full for the, on the second. Full choke for the That's the way I hunt is with the modified full, and I think it's probably your best way because remember, your first shot's going to be relatively close with birds right in your decoys, and normally they'll get up and go and be going away from you when you have to take that second shot. Now, if you look at, we talked about shot sizes, four, six, eights, tens, and twelves. I like to shoot a three inch, such as you see right here. It's a three inch Magnum two, and I shoot fours on my first shot and twos on my second shot, like Terry was saying. And the thing you have to bear in mind now, some places across the country, some places, you're going to be required to shoot steel shot. You have to check your local regulations, and don't be surprised if across the USA, you're not going to see more use of the steel shot in years to come. Now, I've heard tell, Terry, that you've said other things I want you to listen to this. He said other things as to why he really uses an over and under. You never need more than two shots. <laughs> Third if shots. you can believe that, let's get back to the goose blind. Third shot's always wasted, Dick. <laughs> My dad and I have owned Ford trucks for as long as I can remember. If somebody had told me uh, three months ago that I'd be driving a Chevy truck, well, I, I wouldn't have believed them. Well, I took a look at the, at the new Chevy truck, and they, they've totally redesigned the truck. And test drove it. That was enough to sell me on it. It's got the Vortec V6. It's got plenty of power. They've had tough competition from, from Ford, and they've, they've, uh, they've beat them. The heartbeat of America, that's today's Chevy truck. Chevrolet's done their homework on this truck. Before you leave the subject of the shotgun, you want to make sure that all safety rules are just strictly adhered to. Keep the barrels up when you're loaded inside of your blind or your pit. Make sure the safety is on, so safety on and barrels up and 100% safety with the shotgun itself. 
Well, Terry, the decoys are set. It's nice and warm in here. Enjoying a cup of coffee. What are some of the other things that, uh, you know, we need to talk about? Uh, maybe personal camouflage or, uh, you know, goose, how they react to different uh, uh, areas, different weather conditions? Well, I think certainly camouflage is an important uh, subject. Um, geese have extremely good eyesight, as you know. Well, I guess. And if, um, if you're not aware all times that uh, movement can spook the birds, um, I think uh, you've um, wasted some of your effort in uh, putting out decoys and camouflaging your blind. Um, movement, <clears throat> you mean uh, us moving in the blind or the pit? Right. Or, uh, that calls not only attention to the pit, but uh, movement to the geese is really sort of unnatural unless it comes from the decoys themselves. Um, anything that shines, particularly on a sunny day like today, um, really has some real care has to be taken. If, uh, for example, the glasses that I wear, if I uh, am facing into the sun and get a strong reflection off those glasses, uh, it's a dead giveaway to the geese. That'll the spook them, they'll Ab flare off of you? Absolutely, they, they what just about, went on decoy. Well, let's assume we've had geese in the decoys, and maybe we shot two or three, and maybe we're shooting a pump or an automatic, one that ejects the, you know, the shells somewhere else. It, are, is that a concern of ours, to maybe have shells laying around, empty shell cases? Certainly, Any, anything that can shine like uh, the brass on, on an empty uh, outside your blind is, uh, has the potential to spook geese. Uh, anything at all outside the blind that is unnatural. Uh, in blind camouflage, uh, we try to break up straight lines and corners. Uh, right. those That's things, a good point. Those good things point. are unnatural in nature, and uh, geese, uh, particularly after the first week or two of the season, become very uh, aware of those things, and it's much tougher to, to decoy them close, the way you and I like them. Um, it, is just essential that you do a good job of camouflage both of your blind and of, and of your person. You know, Terry, basically what we talk about here is decoying geese, and a rule around our blind is that the geese have to be less than 10 feet off the ground, backpedaling with their feet down before the pit boss says, take them. And uh, I think everybody has to have a pit boss or a blind boss, don't you? I, I think that's important if there's a lot of movement inside the blind by everyone it just multiplies your chances of being detected by the geese um, you and I have hunted together long enough that you fairly well know what I'm going to do and I know what you're going to do and between the two of us we can communicate and and make sure that we know where the geese are when they're working our spread and uh, make sure that uh, as they approach uh, we're going to get our best opportunity um, it's important to us to have those geese in close. We don't like long shooting and, and chancy operations. Well, but. I'll tell you the reason I don't like a long shot is because the way I shoot a shotgun, why, uh, the closer the shot is, the better off I am. And of course, one of the big sure. reasons, folks, is uh, decoying gets the birds much closer to you and there's less chance of a cripple getting away. And we have to protect against that being hunters. Uh, you don't want a cripple going off and dying somewhere. They could die and five miles it could die in five days but uh, try to avoid that so use decoys even if you don't want to decoy them down like terry and i do 10 feet off the ground you can use your decoy field if it's set up properly and you watch movement everything's camouflaged well use that decoy field to pull the birds down from maybe 80 yards to 30 yards that's that's exactly it on a on a bluebird day like today um the geese tend to fly high to begin with and uh, with the use of a decoy spread, you have potential at least to bring them a little bit closer. Uh, I wish we get a little wind or something today. What does uh, wind got to do? Well, wind brings our birds down. It makes them fly uh, lower at, at uh, uh, lower elevations, and they don't tend to fly as far away from the refuge or resting points either. And it just it makes it uh, uh, potentially easier to decoy your birds. What do they now? When you say they fly away from you know, where they're staying overnight in, in the middle of a frozen lake or in the middle of a field somewhere, you know, very well protected where they can see all approaches. They're flying out to what, cornfields or? Flying to some sort of feed in this part of the country would be mostly corn. Uh, occasionally it's winter wheat or uh, wheat stubble, but mostly here uh, it's gonna be corn stubble. So they don't, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't worry about looking for them then on a, on a slough or something like this feeding. Uh, I don't think you're gonna find them on a slough uh, uh, this time of year unless you have a real good storm. If it's uh, wind-driven snow, um, 
They may sit on in where they can, where they, they get may, a chance to. They may, and then potentially they, they'll sometimes go to water, like on the river for an hour or so to get some water if everything in the countryside besides the river is frozen. Well, now, what you're saying then is if we're hunting over our corn fields and our grain fields and winter wheat, we don't need a dog. Is that what you're saying? A, well, to hunt a, geese. A, a dog is always a nice thing to have around, but it is less uh, important to have it over uh, uh, dr in dry land hunting um, than, say, if we were uh, shooting off a lake over, over uh, floating decoys. Um, on water, a dog is just, just, essential. It's just, essential. just essential. Well, it's more essential for duck hunting, though, isn't it? than it is for goose hunting. Certainly. Like Certainly out here, our, or right here today, and you know, we've hunted out here several years and a number of years together, uh, we have no use for a dog because once a goose comes down within range and he's 10 feet off the ground and we drop him, the simple matter just walking out in the cornfield and picking him up. Yeah, they, they, we, we just have no cripple loss here once they're on the ground. Before you really get out here to hunt with a shotgun, you should visit your local trap range or your skeet range and get your eye and your shotgun in fine tune. Uh, which leads me to this, actually leading and shooting a goose. When you pull up on a goose, what you need to do is pull up to the goose, right in the center of the goose, come left or right through his beak until you see just a little bit of daylight and then squeeze off, but continue to follow through with your shotgun and string out your shot. The bird will come up into the shot that way to be more successful. We talked about setting decoys in a cornfield, in a cornfield set. Now, something that's probably overlooked a lot across this country is an ice set. First, we need some clean ice, which we've done behind me here to the left, as you can notice. We've swept off an area, and what we're trying to do here is make it look like open water. Now, you can accomplish the same thing by using black plastic. Take a piece of black plastic uh, sheeting, you can buy it at a local hardware store, and cut it out in an irregular pattern and lay it on top of your ice. Now, the next thing is decoy placement. Place your decoys in small groups around the edges, as you can see we've done here. Now, you can either build a blind close by this location. You can uh, put on a set of white coveralls and lay in the snow, or you may even want to lay out on the ice somewhere. Better you than me, because I like it in a nice, warm blind. But if you're even conservation minded, what you can do is build some nests like we've built around our pond, and that keeps the geese around and they'll even hatch more, and it's going to improve your hunting as years go by. Terry, we've talked about, you know, setting the decoys and how to call them. The one thing we haven't talked about, as you know, is uh, what do you hunt out of? Most normally, hay bale blinds. Blinds made out of plywood, such as what we're hunting in here, and pits. Which do you prefer? Well, everything else being equal, I think the first thing we would like to have is a good pit. Um, pits are the best camouflaged or least noticeable of any of the types of things that you're going to hunt out of. Why? Well, you can put them out in the middle of a field, the middle of a flat expanse where a goose feels confident to land to, to begin with. And uh, above surface blinds, such as this one, uh, necessarily should be along an edge where there is some natural cover. Um, fence rows, fence rows, like tree rows, places like that. There are limitations to where you can put pits though, as you well know. And in this location we can't put a pit because of the water table. Yeah, 18 inches down is where our water table is, so as a result we have to suffer through an above ground blind blind like this that's in a natural flyway, a place that geese pass over often anyhow is the next best choice. Uh, and then you just simply must do your best to camouflage the, the blind as well as you can. If you're going to make one or build a blind or pit, make it of adequate size so that you can stay in there all day with comfort. Indeed. I think the key, Terry, is comfort. Uh, well, I agree. I think you hunt better if you're comfortable. If, if you know, a, a smart man once told me that any moron can come out here and freeze to death. But if well, you, isn't that the truth? If, if you're a little bit warmer, you pay attention better, you're more inclined to stay in the pit or blind, and pay attention to what you're doing. Well, now, would you build, <clears throat> all right, let's take a blind like you're hunting in here, 5 by 12 by 4 and a half. Uh, both of them should be the same dimensions, the pit and the blind? Well, I think that's adequate for both. Um, obviously, uh, the um, blind, you would like to make as small and as, and as little, little um, 
uh, less obtrusive as you can, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, you would still be able to make it large enough to have some, some comfort in there. Some, but some we still room. got to camouflage the blind. That's why you're saying keep it small. Absolutely. But the pit really doesn't matter. You can dig a pit whatever size you want to dig. You as long as you've got an adequate cover. Right. And as long as you have a backhoe so you don't have to dig by hand. Boy, that's the truth. And if you're digging a pit, you've got to haul your dirt away, too. Absolutely. You have to haul the dirt away so that when you're finished and that pit is installed and the cover is camouflaged, that that pit looks just like the rest of the field. That's the whole key. These will come to that in a minute. Far more easily than they'll come to an edge blind or, or a surface blind like we're hunting out of today. Well, then in a pit or a blind, if it's snow, we'd have to have some type of a white cover over it. And if it's just normal, you know, uh, cut grass or corn stubble, we'd have to have the, the typical, like your jackets you have on, a brown, dark brown, light brown camouflage color. Right. You try and match up the uh, camouflage or cover for your pit or blind with the existing uh, terrain and vegetation, whatever it may be. If it's corn stubble, you would like it to look like corn stubble. And if it's, uh, if you're out hunting in winter wheat, you would like your blind to look uh, either green or brown, depending upon uh, which part of the wheat field that you're shooting. Nick, you're kind of like me. We like to get into an enclosed blind or pit, turn the heater on, and be comfortable. That's it. In a nutshell, that is it. Good shot. Well, if your decoys are ready, your camouflage properly, this is the result. Canadian geese in the oven. Proof positive. Hi, my name is Jay Warburton, and I would like to invite you to enjoy other titles in the Sportsman's Workshop Video Library Series. Babe Winkleman covers it all in How to Catch Walleyes, crankbaits, spinners, jigs, soft plastic lures, and live bait techniques. This video will assure you more consistent success in your fishing for walleye. The country's foremost big game guide, Dick Ray, takes professional outdoorsman Roger Moore on the hunt of a lifetime. These tips presented in How to Hunt the Majestic Elk will let you join the 20% of the hunters who take 80% of the trophies. In Decoys and Duck Calls, best-selling author Bob Brister will show you the secrets of using decoys and duck calls, adapting to weather and temperature conditions, proper gun selection, shell and shot size selection, and dozens of other secrets for duck hunting success. In How to Hunt Black Bears, you will join Roger Moore and Dick Ray as they seek out their trophy in the golden-covered slopes of the New Mexico Rockies during early fall. Using horses and hounds, you will learn Dick Ray's secrets for success as they bag a big boar. In Kids Plus Fishing Equals Fun, your family will learn all the basics as pros Roger Moore and Gary Klein take over 25 youngsters through the basics of casting, tying knots, rigging and baiting the hook and line, selecting and use of lures, and much, much more. 
Under the narrative expertise of Kurt Gowdy, you will enjoy the finest wildlife photography ever put on film. How to Hunt North American Big Game takes you into the homelands of grizzly bears, Alaskan moose, mountain lions, doll sheep, mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and many other big game animals. In How to Hunt Wild Turkeys, author and wildlife biologist J. Wayne Fears will introduce you to secrets to guarantee your hunting success. He'll show you the best turkey calls and how and when to use them, how to hunt in different kinds of turkey habitat, shotgun choice, and other necessary equipment you'll need. In Secrets for Catching Walleye, Babe Winkleman takes you even further into his secret world for consistently catching walleyes, covering new ways to rig live baits, work spinners, crankbaits, and soft plastic lures. In Introduction to Muzzleloading, Dick Gassaway takes you through the basics of black powder, including the fundamentals of loading and shooting black powder guns and the necessary equipment and accessories to get you started in this exciting sport. It's true, 10% of the bass fishermen catch 90% of the bass. In How to Catch Bass, professional bass fisherman Roger Moore takes you through an extensive crash course in fishing for lunker bass. Learn the secrets of John Wooters, a leading authority on white-tailed deer. He'll show you how to locate productive areas, stocking techniques, how to read buck rubs, horn rattling, bullet placement, and more in How to Hunt the White-Tailed Deer. Archery Tactics for Deer presents the experience of America's most widely published bow hunting author, Chuck Adams, as he takes you through the fundamentals of equipment selection, proper clothing, when to hunt, where to hunt, tree stands and ground blinds, ambush strategy, stocking and still hunting, and many other tips for hunting success. Professional trout fisherman Rex Gerlock shows you all the secrets of successful trout fishing in How to Catch Trout. Whether pursuing rainbows in the Rocky Mountain stream or working a brook trout in some secluded northeast stream, Rex Gerlock's secrets will help you become a better fisherman. Bass Tactics That Work takes you fishing with bass champion Larry Nixon. Larry gives you his secrets for success on every aspect of the sport including lure and bait selection, casting techniques, and tips on where and how to catch bass. How to use soft plastic lures. Four famed anglers share fishing tips and preferences demonstrating how to use a wide variety of soft plastic lures. These pros share pointers on proper lure selection for walleye, bass, trout, striper, and panfish as they fish the Poudre River and the lakes of the Colorado Rockies. New titles will be continuously added to the Sportsman's Workshop video library series. Please ask your dealer about what topics are available.